last time I skipped over the end effects discussion, and um, I'm going to go now to this uh, filter design in the z-plane, which is on this notes page 49, um, about two thirds of the way through uh, notes number six. Um, so we uh, uh, we have some goals with um, with filter design, and uh, and some reasons, uh, for instance, in, in talking about the homework, um, I had just showed you how to do some filtering, some smoothing uh, via um, uh, manipulating the uh, the frequency domain. You know, by by zeroing out uh, Fourier components at high frequencies, that gives us the same thing as smoothing, and, and that's a low pass filter. But it'll turn out that there are are some strong reasons why we don't want Especially always, we don't want to have to filter in the in the frequency domain. So we can do that simple filtering by scaling things in the frequency domain. And like in uh, my applied geophysics class, that's how we that's how we filtered our, our seismic data uh, with that trapezoidal filter in the frequency domain. If you remember that. Um, but there are problems with that trapezoidal filter, and we would rather because we're, we're we have physically recorded seismograms from physical wave propagation. And then this applies also to a lot of other time series. We want our time series to stay causal. Okay? Uh, and the Fourier transform will spread uh, energy around uh, to times before arrivals. You may have seen that if you tried to filter too sharply uh, using the BP filter in, in uh, ViewMap um, on, on some of the uh, uh, on, on like the reflection lab or uh, uh, on some of your field data. Okay, uh, another uh, very desirable quality for a filter, um, maybe not maybe not as important as it used to be, um, but still holding better to our concept of of uh, physics and the physics that creates the data that we record, is that we want our filter to be invertible. And the original motivation was for this was to save space in the computers for the data. Uh, nowadays, you know, with with multi terabyte disks, with almost any data set, it's not too bad of a problem to have to 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 save multiple copies of the data set. So these days, and I, and I think as you did, you know, processing the field data last uh, uh, last spring, uh, you know, you kept you kept. Um, a copy of every single version of every single data set. Um, but it, that used to be much, much harder. Um, and so uh, we would want to apply a filter, but then be able to undo the filter perfectly uh, to save space. Um, and there's still some compelling reasons to do that. For instance, an invertible filter is going to conserve energy in forward and reverse. It's not going to add energy. It's not going to subtract energy. And that, that particularly is a very valuable um, uh, way of honoring the physics that we, that we have. We don't want to lose energy just to computation, unless we intend to. Um, now, invertible filters, you'll find, are, uh, are called minimum phase. Okay? And we're, we're going to talk a lot about what, what it means to be minimum phase, what it means to be invertible, uh, and, and the nice physics that comes along with that. Um, the other thing that, uh, that we'll be able to do in, by designing filters in the z-plane is come up with recursive filters, a, a filter that uses feedback instead of, uh, instead of convolution against a very long filter that's in the denominator of our rational filter. Using feedback, we, uh, we just really pass through this time series once. We, we make n computations instead of n squared. So feedback is, is an amazingly um, uh, time-saving um, trick. And so uh, uh, we, uh, we're actually going to, you know, there's, there's quite an advantage to expressing our, our filters in the z-plane and being able to use uh, recursive feedback. So we can have even very, very large data sets. We can filter them instantly. Okay, because we can use feedback instead of instead of convolution, uh, and and so you know feedback 
can even be faster than a fast Fourier transform. And especially, it, it can be faster than you know a fast Fourier transform followed by a filtering followed by um, by an inverse fast Fourier transform. So the feedback is even faster. Okay, so to have these desirable um, uh, features for our filter, we cannot filter in the frequency domain. We can't do this trick of of scaling down or zeroing out the the uh, the frequencies, you know, in the in the omega domain. Okay, instead, we're going to describe filters in the time domain that involve uh, multiplications uh, products of z polynomials. So we're going to z-transform our data and uh, and deal with it entirely in the time in the z domain, which is actually dealing with it in the time domain. So so let's look at a simple example of a filter like this low-pass smoothing filter. Okay. We want a filter that only passes the the low frequencies, and so an ideal response for this filter would be on this on this omega. You know, zero omega centered plot. All right, that we we zero out all frequencies above some omega sub cut, some cut frequency, and we retain all the frequencies as is. Um, you know, closer to the uh, closer to the um, uh, closer to the uh, frequent the zero frequency axis. Okay, so. What we essentially have here is this box car, this box. You know, it's it's one at low frequencies and zero at high frequencies, and we're going to multiply that by each Fourier. We're going to use that to scale each Fourier, uh, each component of the Fourier transform. So the high frequency components of the Fourier transform get multiplied by zero, and the low frequency components of the Fourier transform get multiplied by one, and that's going to implement this box car filter. Okay, so um, uh, now uh, uh, we're multiplying the Fourier transform by the box car in the frequency domain. In the time domain, that means that we're convolving the uh, the inverse Fourier transform of the box car. We're convolving that against our time data. Okay, against our time series, right? Multiplication in the frequency domain is convolution in the um, uh, in the time domain. So, um, uh, okay. So the next question is, all right, what is the the inverse Fourier transform of the box car? And it's uh, uh, it's a fairly familiar function. It's called the uh, sinc function. It's basically um, a, a, a cosine wave that has been scaled by the uh, inversely scaled by time, okay. But it's only you know it's only a one over t inverse. It's not a it's not a one over t inverse scaling. You know, so you go out to um, uh, a thousand seconds, and it's you know point one per the amplitude is point one percent of what it is at one second, okay. Which means that it, you know, in terms of of wanting to have short time series to do convolution with, it's uh, it's not very good because it has, you know, still some noticeable amplitude at large time, you know, large negative time, large positive time, and and to do the convolution, we got to cut it off somewhere, and that's that cut off is going to result in an artifact, all right. Um, so uh, uh, when we apply it at, uh, and notice that it goes in negative time as well as positive time, this sync function. So you know if we really want the the exact box car, we're going to end up convolving against this thing, which is going to take energy that's late in time, and it's going to it's still going to be sensitive to it. You know, late in time at, at you know if there's energy at a thousand seconds after zero, it's going to put you know, one one thousandth of that back at zero time, because the convolution isn't going to be done yet. You know, it's it's still going on. You know, way back here. Um, so we're going to get what looks like a, a time wraparound. We're going to leave artifacts at small times. 
Okay, and we don't want to do that because we don't, you know, there should there should only be noise at small times, you know, on our on our exploration seismograms, you know, the or the earthquake hasn't, you know, the waves haven't arrived yet. So this is a completely non-physical um, artifact. This this time wraparound. So we can only use. Uh, uh, you know, doing the convolution of the computer in, in, in finite time, we can only use so much of that of that sync function. And and it's cut off to zero at the ends, you know, beyond the time at which we think it's important. And no matter what you do, as long as you cut off some end of the sync function, um, you're gonna get these these um, this artifact in your response. So you know what do we do? Uh, you know we want the perfect box car with the absolute cut at the exact omega sub cut, right? And so we transform it to uh, to the uh, uh, the time domain, uh, and then we cut off the uh, the the law. You know the ends at, at very large positive and negative time. Okay, uh, even effectively. You know even if we have a million. Uh, time points to work with. We're still going to cut off some. So uh, we cut it off, and then we inverse transform that, that sync function, that cut sync function, back to uh, back to the frequency domain. You know, hoping to get this box car. We don't get the box car. We get this this uh, box car that kind of looks like a sync function itself. Okay, it's not uh, it's not constant on the top of the box car, it's wavy. Uh, and it's not zero outside omega cut. It's got these uh, side lobes. Okay? And the worst of it is, you know, we might say, yeah, I, I, I want to keep everything you know, right up to 59.99 hertz, because at 60 hertz, that's where I have the, uh, all the noise from the power lines. Okay? And it is at, at exactly 60 hertz. Okay? So you try that. You try making this steep cut in your filter, and you end up actually, you know, 60 hertz is going to be right here. It's going to be, um, it's going to be, it's going to have a large response. So the the steeper and closer you try to shave that frequency away, actually the the more you're going to end up um, actually emphasizing it. So the, the steep uh, cutoffs in the frequency domain will actually end up uh, emphasizing the, just the noise you're trying to get rid of. That's called uh, Gibbs phenomenon. Um, you know, no matter what you do, if you make the cutoff in frequency too steep, you're going to get these little ears. And you're going to you're going to end up accentuating the noise that uh, uh, that you thought you were trying to kill. Okay. So you know we can keep more and more of that uh, of that uh, uh, of that time of that sync function in time, okay? But the ears never the ears never go away because we have finite time. The uh, you know we don't have infinite time here, so so the ears they get narrower and narrower, but they also get bigger and bigger. So uh, it's a it's this Gibbs ph phenomenon. Um, is uh, 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 is a real problem with uh, you know with even with a simple low pass filter uh, that we ought to be able to implement in the frequency domain. Okay. Uh, now what do we do uh, like with the BP filter? That's why we had this trapezoidal uh, response that we that we imposed on the filter. So you know at some uh, low cut frequency, yeah, it was well. Let's see at some High cut frequency, yeah, it's it's a zero response beyond that frequency, but we ramp it up. We ramp up the response. You know, we get a hundred percent response um, below the uh, uh, the high up, which is here, and we have zero percent response below the uh, or above the the high down. Okay, um, <clears throat> and again, this is a low pass filter, so I'm showing you both the positive and negative frequency. Uh, sides of it, uh, you can move the filter up to just be within the positive frequencies, but then you'll you'll have a symmetric filter that's also in the in the the negative frequencies. Um, 
just just as I showed you with that conjugate symmetry of your uh, of your filtered uh, data in the frequency domain. So there, that that filter response is essentially duplicated at the negative frequencies, as as it is here. You know, it's it's symmetric. Um, so uh, uh, you remember what proportion? You know what what I specified is the minimum proportion of those uh, of the ramp. You know for uh, for for tailing off the uh, uh, the trapezoid. Yeah, yeah, and twenty percent is pretty safe. Um, but there's still you know even with twenty percent ramp, uh, you know over a range of twenty percent of the of the cut frequency you're you're aiming for. There's still a little bit of Gibbs phenomenon, so that's one of the problems we have with um, with frequency domain filtering is that we're assuming a um, we're essentially assuming we have a finite uh, time response, and uh, and we're cutting off that sync function in uh, uh, you know at at large times, large non-zero times. Okay, so let's let's define a simple low pass filter uh, that's going to be convolved in the time domain and uh, and described on the z plane. Okay, so remember our, our integrator, which was one plus z, and the uh, the integrator had uh, had a uh, had a zero, right? Um, so if uh, f of z is zero, then z is equal to minus one, and that's the uh, the zero, the root of that uh, of that uh, integrator, and that and that put the uh, the zero, the root on the unit circle at minus one over here. Um, and we want to make an adjustable low pass filter, okay? And um, the adjustment parameter is going to be this alpha, uh, and and this is a um, uh, and 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 uh, take away these uh, absolute value signs; uh, they're incorrect. So alpha is going to be greater than zero. Okay, and that's going to be our adjustment parameter. Um, and the uh, uh, the root of um, okay. And so here's our here's our filter time series, right? Only only two. Uh, time samples, right? One and one over alpha, and that leads to this very simple two-term z polynomial of uh, you know first-order z polynomial of one plus z over alpha. Okay, so convolving this is a breeze, right? I mean, this is uh, you know the convolution only has to run, you know, it, it just takes two n uh, uh, multiplications, right? So this is a nice short filter, easy to convolve. Okay, it's going to have a fast convolution because it's only two, two time samples in itself. So what what can we do with this filter? You know, it doesn't. We can adjust alpha to anything we want, any any uh, positive real value we want, without without making it more complex. <clears throat> you know, it's still going to say, take the same computational time. Okay, and so the root, of course, is at uh, z naught equal to minus alpha. All right. So here's an example for uh, uh, an alpha greater than one, right? I mean, this filter could also have alpha at less than one, but here, here we're we're making it greater than one, and it is um, uh, so that moves the the root outside the uh, uh, the unit circle. So z zero is at uh, minus alpha, and it's an alpha is greater than one, so it's outside the unit circle. Okay. <clears throat> So um, okay, there's the point about convolution not being expensive, and now now we ask the question: Okay, what is the spectral response of this filter? Right, we have a filter time series, okay, a filter um, uh, a a, uh, a filter um, uh, in the in the z domain, which is uh, one plus z over alpha, okay. And and how do we find the spectrum? Well, first we got to take we got to take we we got to take it from the z domain to the Fourier domain, right? So all we have to do is put in the Fourier definition of z, okay? Which is z is equal to 
e to the i omega delta t. But remember, I, you know, I'm assuming delta t is equal to, uh, to 1 here. So it's just e to the i omega for simplicity. And so the Fourier transform is 1 plus uh, e to the i uh, omega over alpha. Right. That's all we're doing. We're just making the, the Fourier substitution for z. Okay. And, uh, and the amplitude spectrum is the um, the amplitude spectrum is the um, the magnitude at, at each frequency omega. It's the magnitude of the Fourier transform of the filter, right? Which is here. F of omega is is this, okay? And 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 you know by the magnitude I mean the square root of f conjugate times f. Okay, so we just crank through the math, right? Uh, e to the i omega is equal to uh, cosine uh, uh, omega um, uh, plus uh, uh, i sine omega, right? So we uh, we take the uh, we take that uh, times its uh, its complex conjugate, right? Adding add, of course adding the one and you know, scaling by alpha and all that, and here's what you get. Okay, um, this might look a little bit familiar, but it's uh, one plus one over alpha squared plus two over alpha times cosine omega. The the signs have gone away, um, of course, uh, by multiplying the Fourier transform by its complex conjugate. That gets rid of all the uh, imaginary parts. Okay, uh, you know, it's just like squaring it. Uh, so, uh, uh, and notice that if alpha is greater than one, um, you know this this has a value at every omega and every alpha. I mean, nowhere does this square root break down. Okay, it never it never goes zero. It never goes negative. Okay, so the you know the behavior here is very very simple, very nice. You know, no no caveats. Okay. And uh, okay, it's this uh, square root of one plus one over alpha squared plus uh, two over alpha cosine omega. So it's basically a cosine wave, right? That's uh, raised by one plus one over alpha squared. Okay, and uh, 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 well, actually, it's a square root of a cosine wave. Okay, so the amplitude spectrum is. Um, uh, is over boy one over alpha. Did I really? Uh, I don't know. Maybe I'm maybe I'm really thinking about the uh, the square of the amplitude, which would be the power spectrum, because at the top it's uh, let's see. So at zero frequency, it's um, uh, oh no, it's the square root. One over alpha, one plus one over alpha. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, okay. So that includes the square root. At the top, you know, the, the biggest response is is one plus one over alpha, and the smallest response is one minus one over alpha. Okay, and you know, if alpha was was one, then you know this part would be zero. But we've made alpha greater than one at least a little bit, so. So it still has some response at uh, at the maximum frequency at pi, at the Nyquist. It's got some response, but uh, you know it's got more than twice as much response at uh, at its maximum, which is at zero frequency. So this is a low pass filter, kind of a kind of a gentle one, right? It just kind of ramps down slowly, right? Because it's only a cosine wave here. Kind of ramps. In fact, it's only the square root of a cosine wave. So it kind of ramps down slowly. Uh, but but it is a uh, it is a, it is a low pass filter, and it's a really cheap one. <laughs> you know, it's really easy to describe. Okay. Uh, now, if 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 I want to do a more severe low pass filter, I just apply this you know several times. So if I apply it twice, right? Here's here's the same low pass filter, but uh, in in the z in the z domain. But repeated twice, so I'm just multiplying these two z polynomials together, and and if you work it out, you'll see oh, it's just the square, right? And so here it's uh, you know at the peak it's uh, one plus one over alpha squared, and 
and down here it's 1 minus 1 over alpha squared. Um, and all it is in the z-plane is we got two zeros at this point, you know, minus alpha instead of one. And so we can, you know, we can apply it as many times as we want, and we put as, which is equivalent to putting as many zeros here as we want in the z-plane. And and we can, you know, have the uh, square of this, this to the third power, is this to the fourth power, is this to the hundredth power if we want. And and that's a, you know, that's a way to make a more severe filter. Um, all right, so that's that's one very practical, very simple filter, and and we can make it as you know as severe a low pass filter as we want. Here's a different low pass filter. All right, so instead of putting a zero at minus alpha, we're going to put a pole at beta. Okay, beta is a real number and it's greater than one, and uh, and we're going to put a pole there. Okay, so that's why there's an x on the real axis here. That's locating the pole. Um, okay, so uh, we make this rational filter, and we have in the in the numerator we have one, the z polynomial which is one. That's fine. Um, you know, that's just a spike. That's uh, uh, that's not doing any. The numerator is doing no filtering whatsoever. We put everything in, into the denominator. And it's just one minus z over beta, okay? Just like we created the uh, the zero, but here it's since the polynomial is in the denominator, it's uh, it's creating a pole, okay? Uh, and we ha we have to have beta greater than zero, and in fact we're going to make it um, greater than than one. Um, so we have uh, z sub p, the pole is at beta on the real axis. And very similarly, look at this. Here's the amplitude, the uh, the amplitude spectrum, you know, relative to omega, and it's just one over the same spectrum we saw before. So that that kind of makes sense, actually. Um, and uh, except, you know, here we're describing it with beta just for just to keep things straight. You know, the 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 zero is at alpha and or minus alpha, and the 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 pole is at beta. Okay, and that actually is a is a very similar uh, function. Okay, if you plot it out, uh, you know, like in Excel or or MATLAB or something, you'll find it's got a uh, its high point, which I haven't drawn very well here. Its high point is at zero frequency, and it's at it's beta divided by beta minus one, and then at the low point, it's beta divided by beta plus one. Okay, and if beta was um, um, if beta was zero, then it would be zero here, but we want beta greater than zero. Okay. Um, now these uh, uh, these um, uh, you might you might be thinking, okay, you know, what if what if I don't just want a, a filter centered around zero frequency? You know, I want a uh, I want a filter centered around say pi over two, okay, or um, you know, or or even at pi, all right, um, or maybe at pi over four or pi over three, okay. What if I want to emphasize those frequencies? Okay, um, then you can make uh, you can make alpha or beta complex. And you can put them uh, wherever you want in the z plane. Okay. Then, of course, you know, with a complex uh, root, you've got to have the the uh, complementary root at the at the uh, uh, and it gets a little more complicated, but not much. Okay. So uh, uh, with the you know this description, you know the uh, uh, with a numerator. That is one plus z over alpha, okay, which we can use as many times as we like. Same with the denominator, which is the denominator is one minus z over beta. Okay, with that, we can um, we can make any filter, especially if we can make alpha and or beta complex. Okay, and and that's in fact what we do. We have uh, a we have uh, 
um, zeros that are described for, by these uh, 1 plus z over alphas, and as many of them as we want. And we have poles, which are you know, our filters from a pole, which are uh, 1 over 1 minus z over beta in, in as many times as we want. And we can use them. You know, we can use uh, eight different values of, of alpha and eighteen different values of beta. You know, whatever we want. So we just have to make a z polynomial having the right poles and zeros and the right frequencies and, and the right radii. Okay. So what is that going to do? All right. Uh, if you look at the frequency that we have, or the uh, the the simple ones we have, right? Um, let's say we combine these two. So we've got one zero in the numerator of the filter, and one pole, which is the denominator of the filter. And so we've got a zero at minus alpha and a, a pole at, um, at uh, beta. And uh, it turns out the frequency, uh, the frequency um, effect is uh, beta over alpha times alpha plus 1 over beta minus 1, and beta over alpha times Alpha minus one over beta plus one, uh, and and you know if you'd plot that out in uh, you know for uh, against omega for some you know like maybe make both alpha and beta one point one, then uh, you'll get this simple um, you know like uh, uh, sine squared shape or cosine squared shape, and the. Um, um, Uh, and so think think that you're you're you know what's the effect of this filter on different frequencies? Think that you're moving around you know in your Fourier transform of your data, you're moving around the unit circle. Okay, so you got you know zero positive frequency, pi over two positive frequency, and then uh, pi you know the Nyquist positive frequency. And here you got you know minus pi over two positive frequency and minus pi uh, minus the Nyquist over on the on the left side. Okay, so um, uh, it's clear that when you're close to the pole, it's enhanced. Okay, the response you know you're 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 getting more of the frequencies that are close to the to the pole. And then you're getting less of the frequencies that are close to the zero. You know, in, in terms of the filter response. You know, you're you're cutting out what's by the zeros and you're enhancing what's near the poles. And that kind of that kind of makes intuitive sense, I hope. You know, that poles uh, enhance and zeros attenuate. So now here's some some common filters that you can um, that you can compose. And you know, watch out. I, I'm not. I'm not showing any of the conjugate poles or zeros, uh, but they better be there. Okay. But but if you um, if you just look at the you know the one zero or the one pole, then uh, you'll get the amplitude uh, response that's over here. Okay. And in fact, uh, uh, you do have uh, some uh, uh, some of lab two is looking at you know what happens if you just have the uh, uh, the one uh, zero, uh, which actually has to be on the real axis, versus having two zeros by taking that zero off the real axis, because the z-plane program always assumes that uh, you're going to have a conjugate uh, polar zero and real output. Okay, so there is a difference, but these are all for the the single, you know, these amplitude spectra on the right. They're all for the single polar zero. All right, so at some frequency. Uh, centered at omega zero, you know you want to reject that band and, and emphasize the other bands, and so this is going to turn into the cosine, um, and the cosine is going to have a minimum at uh, at omega zero. Notice I put it outside the unit circle. Uh, here I've put it, out, you know, the same distance outside the unit circle at the same omega zero, but I put a uh, a pole instead. So that it's going to turn it from a band reject at omega zero to a band pass at omega zero, because poles enhance. Now let's say you want to you want to get much more selective about which fre which frequencies you you get rid of. You know what if you want a a notch filter, a narrow band reject. You know say to take out that sixty hertz noise. Okay, 
So you would put a a zero, uh, you know, near the uh, at omega zero. Okay, so at sixty hertz, you would put a zero, um, and and you would make that uh, the zero closer to the unit circle than the pole. The pole is just outside the zero. So so if you think about you know, uh, I don't know. One way to think of this is is kind of as a uh, um, maybe uh, maybe with gravity anomaly. Okay, so you've got a the pole is like a mass concentration, and the and the zero is like a like a mass deficit. Okay, and if you're if you're over here on the other side of the unit circle, you can't really distinguish these two. You know they kind of cancel each other out at, at large distance. Okay, but if you're if you're right here on the unit circle at omega zero, you know all you can see is the zero. You know it's the the zero is screening the pole from you. So you get you know you get a uh, a sharp band reject, and then it you know it tends to zero effect, or or you know a response of one, away from this coupled pole and zero, and you can have a pole on a pedestal type of uh, response. You want to enhance just one frequency, okay? So then you you just put the uh, uh, you just put the uh, the pole um, closer to the unit circle than the zero. Okay, and then a uh, a sharp band reject. Um, you know, you might use uh, several zeros. Okay, but you'll find that the the filter response is kind of bumpy. Okay, and um, so uh, uh, you want to uh, the the Chebyshev filter, which you might have heard about, uh, is very simple. It it it's a sharp band reject. Okay, you know, let's say you got pretty Pretty stable noise frequencies, and uh, you want to um, um, you want to have a fairly flat floor on the thing. Then that involves several pairs of poles and zeros, with the zeros closer to the uh, to the unit circle. Okay. Um, all right. Now you can. You know, I've given you a tool. Um, it's really the z-plane module, which is in the uh, um, which is in the uh, 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 which is in the ViewMat uh, software, and uh, I've given you the same uh, uh, test data set that um, um, that Clairbot has in the book uh, for comparison. Um, but you can actually implement, you know, any of these filters for your own data set too. Um, and I've actually found that to be useful, uh, in, uh, uh, you know, more useful than the B, the the BP filter function in, in a lot of data sets. Um, because I, I I you know with a with seismic reflection data, I really want to avoid that. Um, um, you know those those uh, false arrivals before the first arrival. That's a real problem. All right. Generally, uh, uh, you have to uh, click on the instructions to the left just to make sure that you got the mouse focus in the right place. And then there's these very very brief instructions. You know, click here, then point at Z plane. Okay. And so I'm pointing it at the Z plane here, and I have. Um, uh, a readout at the bottom, which is giving me, um, you know, over here, it's giving me the uh, the real and imaginary location that I'm uh, that I'm pointing at. So uh, uh, over here on the left side, I'm at one, uh, and on the uh, on the right side, I'm at um, uh, minus one. Um, See why is it uh, a little bit more? Have to figure that out. Um, I'm getting the uh, the frequency, you know, two pi f, and then uh, f is um, so omega is is indicated, and then f in hertz is indicated, uh, and then also the uh, the rho for the polar form. So um, you know, right at the bottom, I'm right on the. Uh, 
at the bottom of the z plane here, um, I'm right on the unit circle, okay, because rho is just a little bit less than than one, and up here, you know, I'm way far outside the unit circle, okay. Uh, this only represents so this only represents you know the positive frequencies from uh, from zero to uh, to uh, the Nyquist, and it only it only represents outside the unit circle. Okay, so um, I put a zero. This is the differentiator. I put a zero at zero frequency. Okay, so that's gonna. And of course, a differentiator is a uh, is a low cut filter. It removes the differentiator removes the zero frequency part, and uh, that's what's in yellow here is showing you the res the the frequency response of the filter. Okay, not a you know it's just uh, it's gonna and it's gonna scale the filter to to you know, the filter response to fit within the window. You can't get the actual values of the response out of this. Um, so we have a, uh, uh, a zero on the uh, um, at at zero frequency, and then here is the uh, the filter time series, and you can see that it's one minus one, you know one here, one times z to the zeroth power, and then minus one times z to the first power, z to the first power, okay one minus one. Um, now I can move that zero. To uh, to the Nyquist, right? And here we have uh, one one is the filter time series, <clears throat> and that's uh, that's uh, uh, you know one plus z, one plus one times z. That's the integrator, and as you can see, it's a low pass filter. Okay, um, and I should be able to yeah see there it's at uh, minus one. And here it's at one. Um, and in between here, I can actually get it to uh, pi over two. Um, let's see. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well. 6e17. Well, anyway, that's close to zero on the uh, the real, and the imaginary is pretty close to one. So that's up at pi over two. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, and you can see uh, what's this one now? Now there's more than one zero, so there's actually three samples here. This is one zero one. Okay. Uh, that's only the real part of the filter. Right. Remember, it was uh, uh, it should be one uh, minus i one. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's a real filter. Why is it a real filter? Because it's um, because there's more than one zero here. There's also the conjugate one. That's at minus pi over two. Okay. So um, notice uh, the instant I take the zero off the off the real axis. The shape changes radically, right? And that's because I added, you know, here with the zero on the real axis, it's uh, uh, it's just there's just one zero. But I take it, you know, a, a micrometer off the real the real axis, and it's a um, and 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 it's put a uh, a complementary zero. At at uh, negative one point eight hertz. Okay, and so notice that it kind of went from a, uh, a one over omega response to a uh, well, actually went from a cosine response to a cosine or a sine response to a cosine response, like a co and a cosine squared response, really. So that's um, uh, that's how you can work it. Um, and I can uh, I can add as many zeros as I want. You know, if I click here, I've got a zero at the uh, uh, at the Nyquist, um, and I can uh, uh, click in here and add zeros uh, elsewhere. Um, and you know, whenever I you know, so here's the the real filter, 
and here is the uh, uh, here is the response. Um, and uh, what time is it? Um, okay. So um, uh, and then uh, if I just point somewhere and I press P for poll, then I put a poll there. So uh, you know I'll put the poll. Uh, let's see. Let me get rid of the zeros by pointing at it and pressing X. Okay. And um, I'll point here. I'll get a poll and another poll. So there's there's you know three poles on pedestals, um, and I can uh, I can try to arrange them um, you know to be a little more uh, uh, sensible. You know, so I, I here I'm going for a a band uh, enhancement. Uh, you know, this would be uh, like a Chevy Chev band enhancement. And then I just switch the positions, put the zeros closer to uh, um, closer to the bottom, closer to the uh, um, closer to the uh, um, uh, the unit circle, and uh, and as you can see, I haven't done it, you know, very exactly, but there's a uh, there's a kind of, kind of a Little bit of a classic Chebyshev filter. Um, and I can go for uh, you know much more rejection by putting the zeros closer. And I'll try putting the poles in the right spot. You know, if I don't get it right, if it's a little bit skewed, then um, then uh, yeah, it's it's hard to get them in exactly the right place, and um, uh, actually there ought to be a way to uh, to uh, program in the uh, uh, there ought to be a way to program in the the exact poles and, and you know the exact complex locations you want. Uh, don't have that yet. Uh, let's see. Uh, help is in a different spot. Okay, so uh, uh, when you get the data loaded with this, um, then uh, um, you can uh, uh, you can do you can actually filter some data with this instead of uh, uh, instead of just uh, uh, just playing with it. Um, but that's another tool that that. You know, I, I I'd like you guys to uh, to have available. Um, let's see. Yeah, and it's it's pretty amazing that that you know it can actually keep up and you know you can keep uh, calculating things uh, on the fly here. Um, but you know, you can see that this filter is uh, still relatively short. Right there's there's uh, three zeros on here, so there's six in the whole complex plane, right? With the complementary ones, so we ought to have what seven samples? We got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah. In the uh, and and you know the filter is zero after that. Now of course you put in you put in poles, and um, uh, and that that does make the uh, the you know. So now here I've made a, a filter that you know is really going to enhance this particular frequency, and it's clearly going to go on, you know, for way way past the, the amount of time I show here. Okay, uh, but if I you know if I want to stop it from going on so long, right? I mean this filter is yeah this one this is a, this is a sinusoid that's never going to end, right? So I put this pole here, and I get a sinusoid at this frequency, thirty hertz. Um, and uh, and it's it's a it's a pure it's a perfect sinusoid. It's never going to end. But if I want it to end, then I just put it up here, you know, further from the unit circle, and it ends pretty fast. And then you can you know take it as as far as you need to. Of course, its effect is much less. Well, here's a actually this is a pretty nice uh, low pass filter right there. 
<laughs> um, and I can, you know, I can make it really severe if I want. Um, you know, that's a that's a fairly severe bandpass filter right there. That'll that'll make, that'll take any data and make it very ringy. Um, Yeah, see, so, you know, I'm not managing to get them uh, lined up well. Uh, maybe, maybe that's actually it. You it just, it's not plotting the the response very well. You can see a little bit of the the uh, the notch there, but it's cutting off too much. Yeah, there's the notch. That is a little bit too hard. Okay. Um, right, so um, uh, that I think is good enough for today.